Hello and thanks for joining us for another edition of Northwest Newsweek. I'm Mitchell Ringos. The OPP have confirmed that a suspicious death in Bacanjacum First Nation that occurred on September 25th is in fact a homicide. 24-year-old Jerome Quill of Bacanjacum has been identified as the victim. Two people, a 20-year-old and a 17-year-old, also both from that community, have been charged with first-degree murder. The accused remains in custody and the police investigation continues. A candlelight vigil was held in Winnipeg last night for a man from Webuque First Nation who died soon after being forcibly restrained by Winnipeg police last weekend. The interaction with police officers was caught on cell phone video by a bystander. And a warning to viewers, the footage is disturbing. The video shows two Winnipeg police officers using force to subdue the man on Sunday evening. Officers were called about a man in the street acting erratically and punching a vehicle. Winnipeg's police chief says the man became combative when officers arrived and they struggled to control and restrain him. The man eventually lost consciousness and was pronounced dead in hospital. Manitoba's Independent Investigations Unit is now probing the incident. Family members in Webuque have identified the deceased as Elias Whitehead. Webuque Chief Cornelius Wabas has issued a statement extending condolences but reserving comment while the investigation continues. Around a dozen people attended a vigil on Thursday night to remember Whitehead. The federal government is pushing Ontario to develop better ways to protect a struggling at-risk species. Boreal caribou populations have been declining and regional leaders met in Thunder Bay this week to discuss potential changes. But some delegates are concerned about the negative economic economy impacts that additional protections could bring. Cilios Fellows reports. Ontario has been directed to take additional steps to protect an at-risk species and symbol of our nation. Population is about 5,000 and they want to make sure that that's there and continues to grow. Boreal caribou were declared a threatened species 20 years ago, with the federal government now asking the province to establish a plan to protect them. That was the focus of a gathering of regional leaders at the Da Vinci Centre, organized by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. The media wasn't allowed to shoot any video of the meeting. Marathon Mayor Rick Dumas was in attendance and believes they need to find a middle ground, fearing how certain protections could affect the northern economy by limiting mining and forestry projects. The reality is we also have to, to protect the species at risk, which is us, the humans that live on the landscape. And hopefully it all works out at the end of the day. We protect the caribou, we protect the people that work in the north, and we also pr bring a plan back to the federal government to say, here's what we believe, how we can protect the species at risk. The federal strategy requires the provincial plan to explain how certain areas can have a minimum of 65% of undisturbed habitat for caribou. Others in attendance questioned how caribou preservation could affect other species in the region. Moose, we see, as have been kind of identified as a bit of a scapegoat species. The Northwestern Ontario Sportsman Alliance's John Kaplanis talked about the importance of preserving caribou, but was fearful expanding protections could have unintended consequences on the moose population. In the continuous zone for caribou, moose are kept at low numbers. So we don't, we don't really want to see additional pressures placed upon moose necessarily. Uh, so we're cautiously watching that. Ontario has been given until April of next year to show its approach to protecting caribou matches that of the federal government. TBT News did reach out to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for a comment on caribou preservation, but they were unable to provide one by our news hour. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. Open houses took place in Thunder Bay and Geraldton this week for the Northern Roadling Project. The public sessions are meant to give area residents the chance to learn more about the environmental and impact assessment processes along with the project as a whole. The Northern Road Link would be located between the proposed Martin Falls Community Access Road and the proposed Webuque Supply Road, connecting the Ring of Fire mineral deposits to a new road network. The two First Nations are conducting a coordinated environmental and impact assessment under the Ontario Environmental and Federal Impact Assessment Acts for the design, construction and operation of the proposed all-season multi-use road. That information was presented at an open house at the Victoria Inn, which Public Relations Officer Stephanie Ash says is not only meant to inform the public, but also to get important feedback. 
That input helps inform decision making, helps uh, guide the communities as they uh, continue to advance uh, through the different stages uh, of a project like the Northern Road Link. And feedback is just one aspect of data collection. As project co-lead Kasim Sadiq says a project of this scale has really never been done and it will take years of collection before they can even start construction. So we expect that based on the data requirements of the federal process, which requires two years of data, uh, that the draft report would be complete in 2027 uh, for review by uh, Indigenous communities as well as by regulators and members of the public. Sadiq says they are looking ahead in the project, especially when it comes to jobs, as Martin Falls and Webakwe have started a community-level process to assess the type of jobs needed along with an employment readiness plan. The number of jobs associated with a pro, uh, project uh, are larger than community members in either Martin Falls or Webakwe, so the, the immediate preference right after would be for neighboring communities to participate uh, if they choose to do so both in employment readiness, training programs, and then to have uh, preferred jobs uh, at the project level as well. A similar open house was held in Geraldton on Thursday, and another one is planned for Timmins on November 13th. A Dryden man who was arrested last month now faces two counts of attempted murder after he allegedly attacked a pair of OPP officers as they responded to an assault call. 30-year-old Dylan Ames is accused of attacking the officers with an edged weapon back on September 5th. He's also charged with assault with a weapon, resisting a peace officer and public mischief. Ames was also convicted of assaulting a police officer in a separate incident last December. He remains in custody. The Port of Red Rock is starting to make waves as local residents converge on the site of the former mill last week for a chance to see firsthand how the cleanup effort is coming along and what they can expect as the project continues to develop. Lee Noonan was there. It's hope. It's, I, I never quite felt like this before in my life. Former mill worker Wayne Plant was one of hundreds of residents from the Red Rock area who toured the grounds of the former mill. Plant says he's in disbelief about the drastic changes, but feeling good about the prospect of a port in Red Rock. These people come in after all these years and give hope to the town, hope of maybe some employment of some steady jobs for younger people. Red Rock Indian Band owns a 51% stake in the project and Chief Marcus Hardy says he's never doubted they'd make good on their commitments. All you have to really do is look around to see if uh, any developments happened. It has um, and right now as we speak uh, they're they're taking down the pool C you know they had the the black liquor in there the, the chemical so uh, it, it, it's being remediated as we speak. Hardy says the remediation itself respecting the waters and the land is one of the most important benefits of the project but the First Nation is also seeing economic benefits already with their construction and aggregate companies and band staff working on the development alongside their partners, the BMI Group. The paper mills of the past uh, are uh, f the future of industrial sites. It's connected by rail, connected by big power, connected by gas. Um, so we've bought and invested into other sites similar to this throughout the province and connecting some of the logistical sites uh, such as Niagara Ports and the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority to this site um, really bodes well for the Red Rock Port. Red Rock Mayor Darkeese Robinson says the township has been burned before and some residents have been skeptical of the port development, but that the open house is changing the conversation, particularly with a flyby from a cargo ship, the first to visit Nipigon Bay since 1967, according to BMI. It was, you know, a game changer having that freight liner in, in the bay today. So people realize that, you know what I mean, if the sport does go, we're going to see that more often. And, you know, it's actually beautiful. I'm excited about the potential for this property. And I think that the, you know, current group that are, the BMI group has got the backing to actually make something happen here. We do need the industry to um, help bring in um, more money into the town and more jobs into the town. Uh, we really need that. Although not quite everyone was won over by the progress here at the former mill site, overall the mood in Red Rock is really hopeful. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The Wate power line continues to connect remote First Nations in the northwest to the provincial power grid, ending their reliance on diesel for electricity. 
Casabonica Lake First Nation is the sixth community that's been energized by the $1.9 billion transmission line project. The Wate Power Line project is majority owned by an equal partnership of 24 First Nations to build and operate what they call the line that brings light. So far, six communities have been connected, with the most recent being Casabonica Lake First Nation. Capital Projects Manager for Casabonica, Keith Mason, spoke about how excited they are to finally be over the reliance on diesel as it will help them build much-needed infrastructure and be a shining light for their future. To be able to build homes is a big leap for our community. Uh, uh, all the social challenges and uh, uh, that come with uh, shortage of housing, overcrowding, uh, that's going to address a lot of these issues that we have uh, at the ground level. So we're looking forward to a brighter future. Mason says in addition to housing, more lighting will be added around the First Nation. and One of the bigger changes will be a new high school. We're hoping by the end of the month here in October, um, we're going to be able to open our doors uh, for the students. And they've been waiting patiently for over three years now. The power line is set to span 1,800 kilometers and connect 17 remote First Nations in total. Wate Power CEO Margaret Kenequanash says they're making good progress on the line with the connection of Wanaman Lake soon to be celebrated and several others in the works. Three to connect before the end of December, possibly. There may be two for sure. And uh, the rest of the communities uh, within the KO area, Group 3 we call it, along with Sandy Lake, they will all be connected and uh, we hope to have this project completed by September of 2024. Kenequan Ash says the final step of the project is to make the line 100% Indigenous owned as they have an agreement with their partners that once all the communities are connected, the 25-year timeline kicks in. After the break, we'll have an update on the new school in Big Tagong, Nishinaabe that students are eager to move into. Students in Big Tagong, Nishinaabe, formerly known as Pick River First Nation, were hoping to start the school year in a brand new building. But supply chain and labor issues have delayed the project's completion. Officials hope to open the doors next month. 
Lee Noonan has the details. Work is coming along on the new Big Tagong Elementary School. The building represents more than brick and mortar to the community. It's a fresh start. The current school was the site of a federal Indian day school that operated from 1927 until 1990. It's even hard to hold back my tears thinking about it. Um, I've been an educator in the community now for almost 24 years and I went to school in the school that our kids are in now. So it, it's, it's going to be a really significant time, not just for the existing students, but for the ones to come and also from the students for the past. Ms. Shano Korshane says students and community members had input into the school's new design, which incorporates a lot of natural light and organic colors and materials. The school also has a classroom dedicated to land-based programming, with stainless steel tables and a hanging system for processing moose and other wild foods, an essential part of the school's locally developed curriculum. It's based around our worldview, our teachings, and there's a huge emphasis and strong connection to land. The new school is much bigger and will also boast a gymnasium. Right now, students walk to the community center for gym class. Kids we spoke to say their current school is crowded and gets cold in the winter, and they're excited about all the new space. We have a lot of people, so there's like a bunch of desks everywhere, and we have one wall with our calendar, and our rug takes a, a lot of our space. And when we do gym, we are like all crowded. There are roughly 75 students enrolled now. The new school has space for 100 more. Kids and adults alike are eager to see the building complete. The end is near and uh, we're very, very excited. Daniel Mashano, Big Tagon's capital housing director, says the $25 million project was delayed by a labor shortage, last year's carpenters strike and supply chain issues. Everyone uh, who's associated with the project uh, is very excited to see the finish line. Uh, we could see it. And we're just, uh, every day that goes by, we're, we're getting that much closer. So far, the project is on budget with close to a million dollars staying in the community, going towards local resources and labor. If everything goes to plan, the building is scheduled to open at the end of November. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Thunder Bay Superior North MPP Lise Bourgeois is demanding equal protections for Ontario's fire rangers. She challenged the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry on the province's treatment of its forest firefighters during a question period this week. Fire rangers are the province's wildland firefighting crews who generally work under contract during the forest fire season. Bourgeois and her counterpart in Muskegowak, James Bay, are asking the government to reclassify its fire rangers to give them the same workplace protections as other firefighters in the province after a record-setting year for forest fires. None have been more affected than the forest rangers who put their lives and health on the line for us by fighting these fires. They need to be reclassified so they will be recognized, compensated, and receive the same WSIB protections as all other firefighters. When I was in Timmins last week, we announced $20.5 million to further expand our ability to fight wildfires in this province. And as part of that was a recognition, again, of the fantastic job that our firefighters do, recognizing that we need more strategies around recruitment and retention for firefighters. Smith did not commit to reclassifying the fire rangers as firefighters, but said he asked the WSIB for an assessment. Kiewetanung MPP Saul Mamakwa also spoke at Queen's Park this week, questioning the province's commitment to infrastructure and First Nation communities. Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs Greg Rickford responded, stressing his party is working collaboratively with these communities to improve conditions. Things are different and unreserved. But since I've been here, since I've become a member, I've talked about many issues that need to be improved on reserve. Housing, fire safety, education, mental health, clean drinking water. It is a systemic racism to do nothing and let these conditions worse, get worse. Will this government acknowledge that they have a responsibility to improve these conditions? In First Nations. So we acknowledge that there remain some challenges around things like legacy infrastructure uh, for isolated communities, 
But when it gets right down to it, Mr. Speaker, we have an extraordinary opportunity to work with those communities to open up corridors for electricity, road access to pr improve the health, economic and social uh, conditions of those communities, Mr. Speaker. Increasingly, leadership from those communities are coming to us to have those conversations and develop real opportunities and create real opportunities through my ministries and other ministries in this government. One of the country's most prestigious artists hails from the region, and now Norvell Morisot is being honored with a monument in Nipigon. We'll have more on that after the break. A monument was unveiled in Nipigon on Thursday, commemorating world-renowned artist Norval Morisot and the Indigenous Group of Seven. Lee Noonan has the details. Norval Morisot was a giant in the Canadian art scene, and he's now being recognized with a monument at the Nipigon Bridge Lookout. His son, Eugene Morisot, says he feels proud to see his father's legacy celebrated. Thank you for honoring my father in such a way that I think he would have loved it. The monument features pictures of Morisot on a copper thunderbird in reference to his Anishinaabe name. He asked my mother, what should I put here, uh, his name? So my mother said, was I a Kubanis, a copper thunderbird? So my mother gave him how to write the syllabics. So my father's been using those syllabics ever since, right till, right until the end. Nipigon Mayor Suzanne Kuko says the recognition is long overdue. He's a world famous artist from this region and that absolutely should be celebrated and I'm thrilled that, um, that this monument is here in Nipigon. Norval Morisot, also known as the Picasso of the North, founded the Woodlands style of painting and has inspired generations of Indigenous artists, including his son Eugene. I used to watch my father paint like I would just be arrayed next to him, uh, he would just be over painting like that would just be standing there, right? And me being a, a curious boy, I would uh, ask him, what does this color mean? What is this, what is this, what is that? Eh? 
Norval Morisot spent his early years in Bingui Neashi and Anishinaabek First Nation, about 60 kilometers upriver from Nipigon, and still has many relations in the region. The monument was commissioned by area tourism organization Superior Country. Executive Director Dan Bevilacqua hopes the monument will help showcase the importance of Indigenous people and of arts and culture to the area. So we're hoping that travellers will recognize this and then we'll follow links and, and more information and, and learn more about uh, Norval Morso and the Indigenous Group of Seven. Morso is a founding member of the Professional National Indian Artists Incorporation, nicknamed the Indigenous Group of Seven, an influential group that also includes Carl Ray of Sandy Lake First Nation. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The Pebble Beach Renewal and Marathon has suffered a number of setbacks and delays. It's now expected to reopen on November 13th, but the town has had to significantly reduce the scope of the project. The ambitious $1.35 million infrastructure upgrade will still include a viewing platform, boardwalk, and a new parking lot. However, plans to build a more accessible path down to the beach, replace the playground, and create a campsite have been shelved for now. Mayor Rick Dumas says labor demobilization, supply chain issues, and skyrocketing costs made the cuts necessary. They say we looked at a playground equipment that was 200000 It came back at 500000 You know, the campsite is basically clearing, running some electrical conduit and, uh, you know, landscaping and a couple picnic table areas with concrete pads. That all doubles and tripled from the time we did the engineering report in 22, the end of 21, 22, to go to tender for 23. So it's just like, wow, this is really outrageous. But we knew there was going to be an increase. We just didn't think it was going to be that much. So it's frustrating we had to eliminate some of those key aspects. But it's okay. We still have a beautiful Pebble Beach Park that overlooks Lake Superior. Some remaining elements of the design by Vancouver-based landscape design firm HAPA had to be modified, including the viewing platform, which will no longer be cantilevered over the beach. And that wraps up this edition of Northwest Newsweek. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.